Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. It's great to see a packed house. Um, my name is Tony Levitas. I'm a senior fellow at the Watson Institute, and it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome back uh, to Brown uh, Timothy Schneider. Um, I say back to Brown because Professor Schneider uh, received his BA from Brown some time ago uh, and has since gone on. Not as long as not, 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 not so long ago. In fact, the room is filled with his, his, his mentors. Um, um, and uh, Professor Snyder has gone on from uh, graduating here to become one of the most eminent uh, European historians of his generation. Uh, he received his PhD from Oxford, where he was also a, a, a Marshall Scholar and is currently the Bird White Hulsum Professor of History at Yale University. Uh, he's been amazingly prolific uh, and has written five award-winning uh, books, including the 2010 uh, Bloodlands Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, which will be available for sale and assigning after the talk this afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to try and do justice to the work, but I will say that one of the signature, signature features of uh, his style is to uh, address hugely important historical and historiographical issues and problems through the lives of individuals in ways that make the books both extremely important and great reads. Um, over the last year, uh, Professor Snyder has emerged as one of the leading public intellectuals on in engaging with the Ukrainian crisis um, and what we've been calling here at Watson the Ukrainian crucible in the hope of what might be forged in the future. Um, Mr. Fr Professor Snyder is a, a very business, busy man, and our ability to get him here was due in no small part to Patricia Herlihy, uh, who used all her, of her powers of persuasion and charm uh, <laughs> to get him to <laughs> <laughs> and small threats, right, to get him here. Um, so. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to, to Professor Snyder, whose talk today is Democracy on the Edge in Ukraine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the, the, one thing about the introduction which was completely true was the last bit about Professor Herlihy, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, who, who, who taught me the second part of the European survey um, around about, 19, around about 1989. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be at Brown. It's a great pleasure to be at the Watson Institute, which, is, which was my uh, campus job. Sophomores, junior, and senior year was working at the Watson Institute, or a part, what is now a part of it, or what was then called the Center for foreign policy development. Um, I remember Artemis Joukowsky as a great supporter of that initiative. It's wonderful to be in a room under his name. I'm going to start by, by justifying the subject. Um, I, I want to start by defining Ukraine and Russia in a way which is maybe a bit unconventional. Uh, a, a lot of the way we start with this question is by asking, you know, is Ukraine real? Is Russia, and taking for granted that Russia is real. I want to, I want to put this into perspective, right? I, I want to start by suggesting that this is a little bit like asking whether Canada is real, which admittedly, we lose track of it. It doesn't appear very often in our news, but it's out there, right? <laughs> it's out there, um, even though there's not a Canadian ethnicity, and there's not. I mean, you might think otherwise if you see a lot of Canadian games, but there is not a Canadian ethnicity, and there's not a Canadian language either is there. I mean, there is that interesting way they speak French, but there, there isn't a Canadian. And then if you think another step back and you think about it, there's not an American ethnicity either, right? 
um, you know, much as my WASP forebears might have like proudly wished <laughs> this to be the contrary. And there isn't an American language either, and yet America is real, at least, you know, as real as things can be. So those are the sorts of premises that are the kinds of premises I would start from when we ask about how Ukraine is real or how Russia is real. Um, because Russia also doesn't have a language that's its own. It shares its language with other places, just like England does, right? And no one has a history which is its own. All histories are shared across what are now political boundaries. And there isn't any such thing, um, I'm not breaking any news here, I hope, but there isn't any such thing as ethnicity um, in the sense of, polit in the political sense of some group which is destined to have its own state doesn't exist, right? Retro retroactive category applied after things are over. So when we talk about history in Ukraine and Russia, we have to be open to the possibility, which I think is not a possibility but a certainty, that these are both societies that are in formation, um, whose leaders and whose experiences direct them back towards history in various ways. Which doesn't mean that history is useless. It just means that, in fact, it means that you have to have some sense of history if you're going to have your own opinion about how history is used or not used. So I want to begin with a few general historical observations, which again I might be pitching in a way which is a little bit different than, than accustomed. So history of Russia and Ukraine in, in four minutes or less. I think I can do it. Um, I'm going to do this by way of dates. There, there are a certain set of dates that appear in both Russia and, and Ukrainian history, which all of us who have any, have any kind of survey will be familiar with. Um, 988, for example, the, the, the nominal date um, when, when Vladimir or Volodymyr, um, or he actually was called, probably called something else, and in the Arabic sources he's known by yet another name, and incidentally in the Arabic sources he was a Muslim, right? <laughs> Any of us who want this to be a pure story about Slavs, he was a Muslim. Um, 988 is the nominal year when Vladimir converted to Christianity. Uh, this is the year when the history of, of, of the people of Rus is thought to begin. Uh, 1241 um, is the year when, again, as all of you will know, uh, the, a great part of the Mongol horde led by the Batu Khan uh, was moving west and did away with what remained of, of the state of Rus, of, 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 of Kiev and the Rus. By then, it, it really wasn't, there wasn't much of Rus left because they had this problem. They couldn't decide who was going to inherit what. But we, we take 1241 as the end of the state of Rus and we blame the Mongols, which is kind of doubly unjust because, first of all, the main problem was that it was already fragmented. And the second problem is the Mongols, get a, they get a bad rep in this whole history. They were just trying to reestablish the east-west trade route, and that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, right? That's all they were trying to do. Um, and so they, they, you know, no, people get in the way, things get in the way, you have to move them out of the way, but all they were trying to do was establish a trade route, which brings you back to 988, and an important thing about 988. We would like, or some of us would like, for this to be some nice date when some ethnos was established. <coughs> what happened in 988 with this conversion was that you had this mishmash of a community which was established by Vikings, Again, Vikings like Mongols, bad reputation, or good reputation if you like carnage. Um, they were trying to establish a north-south trade route, right? That's what they were trying to do, Baltic Sea to Black Sea. Nothing could be more sensible than that. Kiev is on the way. If you've ever tried to establish a north-south trade route yourself, you'll be aware that Kiev is conveniently located. It was a trading post. It was a city which was then more or less in the middle of a khanate um, run by people called Khazars. Hazars had just converted, as we now know, this was actually in contention for centuries, but as we now know, to Judaism, right? Right after that, they disappeared from history. You know, you can draw your own conclusions. But before they disappeared from history, they, they engaged with these Vikings, right? So the thing that we don't think about when we think about Kiev and Rus is that this was a, one, of the, you know, one of those rare Viking Jewish consortia. Right? So when Russians and Ukrainians talk about Kiev and the Rus, they very rarely use the phrase Viking, Ju Viking Jewish consortium. Right? Um, but that's as good a description as any other. And I stress this, just like I stress the Mongols uh, three centuries later, how it was already over, just so that we remember that history itself is a lot more flexible and complicated and of its own moment than it is in, in, in retrospect. It makes it kind of material for interpretation, but it's, it's flexible. Okay. Next date. Um, 1569. All right, now here we might be moving a little bit out of the conventional dating of Russian history. What is 1569 so important? 1569 is the moment of the establishment of something called the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. I pick it as just one date in the history of Ukraine, which is a bit different from the normal chronology of the history of Russia. And why do I do this? Because 
after the breakup of, of Kiev and the Rus, um, and I'm simplifying a lot, but this is basically the story, you have two different trajectories of the lands of Kiev and the Rus. Most of them fall under the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which at its time was the largest state in Europe. A bit out of the mainstream, um, fur-clad pagans, uh, so they don't, they don't fit very well into you know, the French and the German and all those nice narratives. But they had the largest state of Europe in the medieval period. It included all of what's now Belarus, most of what's now Ukraine. Um, and that they consider themselves to be the heirs of all of Rus. They use the phrase, it was in their, 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 their legitimation. They actually did inherit Rus in the sense of using the language of Rus as their language of law and state. Um, uh, most of their population was Orthodox, right? So in, the, in those senses, they consider themselves and in fact were the heir of Rus. The second trajectory is the trajectory of Muscovy, which remain, which unlike these territories, remains under the Horde, remains under the Mongols for quite a long time. And then when Muscovy, in, this, in the famous cliche, liberates itself from the Tatar yoke, it is becoming a successor state of the Tatars, right? Which Ukraine isn't really. So that's, that's a kind of fundamental difference in the histories. Now, this of course can be interpreted in lots of different ways, but it does mean that there's a kind of, there's a different kind of foundation for Europeanizing myths in Russia and Ukraine. The Russian Europeanizing myth goes something like, and there are many of you here who I see who are better, who can correct me about this, but the Russian Europeanizing myth goes something like this. We can have it if we want to, right? If we choose to build Petersburg, we can be European, but then we can change our mind five years later and decide that we're Asian, right? And this is kind of the pattern with Russia. We can take it or leave it. We're European, and we want to be Europeans. We're better than you, but we don't have to be Europeans. We can be Asians too, or Eurasians or something. The Ukrainian story, because it's chronological and boring, is much different than that. So in Ukraine, you actually have all the things that we were taught about in middle school. You actually have the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, this stuff which doesn't happen in Russia. And because you have all those things and the architectural traces of them and the lecture in the the, 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 the history of the book and all these things, because you have all of that, you can't so easily say we are, we're not, we are, we're not, we are, we're not, because the, the, the history is actually a much more conventional European one in that it has these stages and it has these engagements. Okay. The next bit of history um, is the 20th century. And I just, again, I'm going to sort of catapult us through it very quickly. Three dates, 1922, the formation of the Soviet Union, 1933, at the end of the five-year plan, um, 1945, the end of the Second World War. 1922 is obviously a moment when, which, in which Russia and Ukrainian history have something in common. They're both, most of what's now Ukraine, all of what's now Russia are part of the Soviet Union. 1933, the end of the five-year plan is an important moment because as you know, I'm sure most of you, um, the attempt to industrialize the Soviet Union very quickly in the first five-year plan leads to famine, um, more or less throughout the Soviet Union, worst in Kazakhstan, very bad in southern Russia, and with the political coloration in the Ukrainian Republic. That is, there's a certain amount of political decision-making um, in the Politburo by Stalin to confine starvation inside the Ukrainian Republic. So about three million people die there who don't have to. That matters in a kind of direct way from memory because it's one of these things where if you're in Russia, you can decide whether or not that's going to be part of memory, and generally the answer is not. Whereas if in your in Ukraine, you generally can't decide. That is to say, if you are from a family which came from Ukraine, just like if your family was from Bengal or a century ago from Ireland, you don't have the option of forgetting that you know grandmother was a cannibal or whatever it might have been. Um, you don't have that option because it's it's simply too terrifying, right? Um, the, the the experience of mass starvation is a social experience, and it's it's horrifying for those who survive um, in in ways that are not easy to rub out. 1945, though, is where I want to just pause for a minute because I think 1945 is where things are getting truly interesting in, 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 in political myth. And in a way, it brings us into our subject because one of the features of our subject is that political myth and politics are running side by side. They're like two horses dragging the same carriage. Um, 1945 was, in general, a myth that united Russians and Ukrainians until very, until very recently, 1945 is the victory in the Great Fatherland War. That is the Soviet telling of the Second World War in which the Second World War begins not in 1939. Why not? Because of the molotov ribbentrop Pact, we forget all about. It begins in 1941 when the Germans attack the Soviet Union. Um, and that is the common, in terms of social memory, the common experience of Ukrainians and Russians. It's a bit different, of course, because the war was actually fought in Ukraine and only and not really fought in Russia. 5% um, of Russia was occupied right, 5%, whereas all of Ukraine was occupied for, the, for about two years of the war. But basically, the social memory is the same. We fought, we fought off the fascists, um, and this was our great triumph. We saved Europe. We saved virtue. 
um, we saved the Soviet Union. That was basically in common until very recently. What has changed it is the present, and this is this is how things now are in flu are fluid. And this is my this is my final answer, and I hope an interesting one to the, to the question: How are Ukrainians and Russians different? Um, Occam's razor always tells you like not to start with 988, but to start from now, right? If you're going to ask why you know why, why two people or two groups or two nations are different, better to start from now than from 988 as a general rule. Um, and what's happening now, I think, is actually what's decisive. How do I mean that? Everyone who's been following this understands, knows, has seen that the way that Russia programs what it's doing in Ukraine, describes it, the discourse that describes it, has to do with 1945. We're, 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 from a Russian point of view, if you watch a lot of Russian television, which is one of my bad habits, um, you see that what's happening is that fascism, anti-fascism, the political programming of the Second World War has been transposed onto the war in Ukraine. In other words, this, whatever you think about that, right, that is the discourse that's being used. That is the program. That is, those, are, those, are the, those, are the, those are the terms, those are the tropes. And in Ukraine, that's just not true anymore. Why? Because the experience of having a revolution and then being invaded trumps grandma and grandpa, basically. The actual experience of having a revolution and then being invaded trumps even the most powerful myths of the Second World War. So we might have a tendency to look at Ukraine and say, oh, Second World War. The, Russia certainly does. But the people who don't that much are Ukrainians. Not that they don't talk about it, not that they don't refer to it, not that the combatants you know, don't talk about where their grandfathers served, because they certainly do. But I mean, at the level of a coherent political myth, the coherent political myth in Ukraine, insofar as there is one, is no longer about the Second World War. It's about 2013 to 2015. And that is interesting, what, one of the things that makes Ukraine different from Russia. Because Russians are seeing these events, are being told to see in any event, these events in light of a myth which has been going on for 65, 70 years. That's not true in Ukraine. Ukrainians are actually living this as a kind of experience. Their myth has to do with living and dying now. And that's, I think, a pretty substantial difference. Okay. So now that I've said that, let me say a word about the, the contemporary history, that is, what has actually happened between 2013 and the present, before I say a word about how I think, how I think it matters. So I, here I want to start with, with, with Russia. I don't want to start with the Maidan. I want to start with Russia, because the, the events in Russia and Ukraine were going in parallel. Um, and things that happened in Russia before 2013 were quite important, just as things that were happening in Ukraine before 2013 were also important, and they met at a certain point. And the place that the time they met was December. But those of you who follow Russia will know what I'm going to say, that the, the thing which happened in Russia before 2013 were the protests of late 2011, early 2012. Very significant in, in, in Moscow and in Russia. I'm just going to read you a couple of things that were said at the time, which I find striking. Um, the, the, the Russian journalist Evgeny Albats, I'm sure some of you know, um, talking about the protests, said, Today we have just proved that civil society does exist in Russia, that the middle class does exist, that this country is not lost. Okay? Uh, President Putin, the same day. She, Hillary Clinton, oh, and by the way, the whole gender issue would, be, would make for a great, that's another subject, like, um, you know, Noonan, Catherine Ashton, Samantha Power, Angela Merkel, Hillary Clinton, all of these women on the Western side, you know, no, no women on the Russian side. There's an awful lot to be done with that and with the whole gay business, but that's not my subject for today. But I think there is something really interesting going on with gender and all this. Anyway, President Putin, Hillary Clinton set the tone for some actors in our country and gave them a signal. They heard the signal, and with the support of the U.S. State Department, began active work. Okay, so the protests are categorized as having been part of an American foreign policy. This is just a foreshadowing of things that are going to happen later. Um, so the way that Russian policy turns after this is what interests us, because part of the larger case that I want to make is that the things that happen in Ukraine, or the policy choices that Russia makes with respect to Ukraine, are consistent with their trajectory, which was already in motion. It's consistent with the turn against the European Union, which happened in 2012, 2013. So after the protests of 2011, 2012, you have the emergence of a new Russian foreign policy doctrine, which is really interesting, called Eurasianism. Um, those of you who study Russian intellectual history will know all of the uh, colorful resonances of that term, Eurasianism. Um, Eurasianism involves a domestic turn against the middle classes, 
an embrace of what can be slightly euphemistically called conservatism, um, a rather, you know, a rather intense form of conservatism, which some people might refer to as gay bashing. Um, I, it involves in foreign policy a turn against the European Union. The first time the European Union is defined as an adversary is in 2013, which is very important. And Europe is defined, and this is a key word in the whole thing, especially if you follow, you know, Central European intellectual history, you'll see why it's a key word. Europe is defined as decadent, right? Why, okay, why is decadent so bad, okay? Now, because we are so decadent, like I've, I've decided I agree with the Russians about this, we are decadent. Because we're so decadent, we think that decadence means that you're a fat Roman emperor and there are 17 women dropping grapes in your mouth, right? When I say decadence, that's what you think of. Decadence means decay. It means you're disintegrating, it means you're over, it means history has run through you, it means you're dying, right? That's what decadence actually means. So this, the, the, it all, and it means you're not doing it beautifully, you're doing it in an ugly, disgusting way. So this turn towards def just defining the European Union as decadent is quite significant because it's saying we're the forces of life and you're the forces of death, right? Okay, I'm now quoting the Pope, but um, we're the forces of life, you're the forces of death. We preserve civilization, you've perverted civilization. If civilization is going to be saved, it's gonna be saved by us, that's the basic idea. The political program, as I'm sure all of you know, was um, for the time being a trade agreement called the Eurasian Union with Belarus and Kazakhstan and some other countries and Ukraine, uh, which, you know, as Foreign Minister Lavrov says, eventually was to stretch from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. So the idea was that Eurasia was going to be the whole was going to be the whole business. Now, meanwhile, the meanwhile is very important. Meanwhile, there's a completely different conversation about about Europe happening inside Ukraine itself. Ukraine under its previous government, right, its previous not especially attractive, unbelievably oligarchic government, um, had decided that it was going to sign an association agreement with the European Union. Um, so I stress this, it's important that it was the previous slightly horrible oligarchic, really disgusting in many ways, government, which had already decided a year um, it, sometime in 2012, it was going to sign this association agreement with the European Union. And all the state propaganda had been pushing in that direction, all the talk shows were going in that direction. Everyone knew in Ukraine the association agreement was going to be signed. Um, the, the, the course was changed in November of 2013 after a meeting between Putin and President Yanukovych. We do not know what was said at that meeting, although my hunch, my very strong hunch, is that what was said was, if you sign, we're going to take Crimea. Um, and the reason that's my hunch is that there was clearly a plan already in place, an operational plan to take Crimea. Um, in any event, at that point, um, one head of state dissuades another head of state, but the story's not over. I mean, I think the story was supposed to be over there. And in a way, the whole history of these events is the story not ending when Putin thinks it's going to end. I mean, the whole, like one whole reading of these events is Putin makes one mistake after another. Um, which unfortunately isn't a good reading because like one reading the Second World War is Hitler makes one mistake after another, but it still it didn't mean th doesn't mean things turn out well. Okay, so this is an error. If the idea was that this is going to end the protest, this was an error, or because th th what happens instead is that uh, students, that is to say university students, people like some of some of you, I mean I noticed that like the older generations have forced the younger generations to stand in the back, which is very, you know, impolite and, you know, but um, the, the university students um, uh, were the first protesters on, in late November 2013. Why were they protesting? Why was it students? It's a very simple thing. Um, the, the European Union means, in Ukrainian context, it means the rule of law because the main Ukrainian political and social problem then, now, hopefully not forever, but so long as there's been an independent Ukraine, has been oligarchy and corruption, which are the same thing. If, if economic power is only in a few hands, it's very hard for there to be the rule of law for everybody else, and everyone who tries, for example, to be a small or medium-sized businessman or woman ends up being blocked. So students are precisely the people who have the greatest stakes in there being fair rules of the game over the long term. Students were the ones who protested. They were then beaten quite badly um, on the night of November 29th to 30th by, by the riot police, at which point this became a mass protest. Um, the idea was that we have to protect our children so there's this, I mean, touching notion, actually, that university students are the future of the country, therefore they shouldn't be hurt. And so when people said our children, they didn't mean literally our children. They meant the next generation, but nashi diti, our children, was what people said. Um, and, a lot, and, and one of the group that came out, the group that came out to protect the students, or the children, as they put it, interestingly, were, were largely veterans of the Afghan war. 
of the war in Afghanistan, Afghansi, where the people who came out and protected them from the riot police. So immediately you have this uh, quite a spread of the demography of the protests, right? Because a lot of these guys were not themselves former university students, to put it in a certain way, right? But and they were of a, they were one or one and a half generations older, actually two than the students. Um, and so at this point, the, the the protests spread out and begin to include members of basically all generations and 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 all and all backgrounds. Um, I'm going to you you know this already, but I'm going to press the point anyway. Ukraine is a multilingual society. The main language on the Maidan was actually Russian. Um, the, the largest group of people at the beginning were students and then middle class Russian speakers because the middle classes in Kiev speak Russian. I mean, there's going to be Ukrainian here who's going to be annoyed at me, but this is basically right. Are you the one who's annoyed? Are you? Yeah, okay, good. Um, but the, the, lang the, the private language on the Maidan is, was basically Russian. In fact, this very typical thing once you get up, you give your speech in Ukrainian, then you go back to your friends and you say in Russian, how was that? And they say it was great, you know. Um, because that is the way Kiev is. It's a bilingual capital, which we have trouble getting our minds around because we are, we are monolingual bilingual, right? And nobody, nobody, nobody in the Western world except the Ukrainians has a bilingual capital. And so, you know, both the Russians and we have trouble getting our minds around this. No, the Swiss do not have a bilingual. The Swiss are not as good as the Ukrainians. It's not the same phenomenon. Okay. Um, so, so the, um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that there was no clear ethnic, linguistic, generational definition to this event. It came from all over, all over society. Um, now, the, the, this obviously, so now you see these two stories come together. And these events from the point of view of the Putin regime in Moscow are going to be categorized as a threat. But not, not for the obvious reasons. I think the, 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 the main reason why this is a threat is that if you are Moscow, it is convenient to have the main oligarch in charge of Ukraine, right? And that's what Yanukovych was. He was trying to set himself up as the main oligarch. The oligarch was above all the other oligarchs. Um, that is very convenient. If you're Russia, you can deal with one oligarch. What you don't want to deal with is a spontaneous, organized Ukrainian society. That is, that's very awkward because, first of all, it's always awkward, but secondly, it could prove to be a model for your society, right? Especially because, I'm now going to annoy my Ukrainian constituency again, especially because it's an East Slavic post-Soviet country where a lot of people speak Russian and a lot of the media is in Russian, right? Including a lot of the best media is in Russian. So it, 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 it looks like a bit of a threat. Um, now, to stress a point I've already made, the Russian propaganda that comes in at this point is all civilizational. So I was following this day by day. It's all civilizational. It's about why would you go on the Maidan because, all, because it's just for Europe and Europe means pedophilia. Right? So the, there was a television program about how the Swe in Sweden it's mandatory to have sex with children and da 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 like, And like on and on and on in this vein. The idea is that Europe is decadent. Why would you be associating yourself with Europe? So the, the Maidan was called the Euromaidan, right? The Euro, the, it was called the Euromaidan this time around, which in Russian then became the gay, I'm not even going to try to do it, but the gay Euromaidan. Um, so like everything European was gay, why would you be gay, right? And um, you know, another, another one which, another, oh, another, I like this one. You can, if you join the EU, you can, you can have free movement within the EU, but first you have, to, you have to have gay marriage. Like, you're allowed to join the EU, but first you have to have gay marriage, right? Um, you, and and the, the, the hard version of this is, if you want to have movement inside, you personally have to marry a man, and then it's okay, right? So they really, really press this. Like, I'm from Ohio, and it really reminded me of Ohio like 20 years ago, right? Which in some sense is like, built, gives me optimism, because like, we were really obsessed with gay marriage for a while. It was just the most important thing in the world for like 18 months, and then we got over it. So like maybe other people can get over it anyway. So, but the, the point here is that the whole push was about Europe. It had nothing to do with NATO or the Americans at this point, because Russian foreign policy was angled against Europe. This was categorized as being Europe, which it was. Okay, the mistake of Russian policy at this point, if you want to see it that way, was to pay off in late December the Ukrainian government to repress the protests. Then the two measures which the Ukrainian government took, first passing a series of dictatorship laws in January 2014, and then shooting um, from the rooftops protesters in February, turned these protests into a revolutionary movement and led to the, led to the toppling of, of the government itself. Um, so, um, and again, that just to, I'll stress this point, I'm probably beating that horse at this point, but when the shootings came, when, when the mass violence came, the people who died reflected the um, the, the complex ecumenical content of the movement itself. So the first two people who died in this Ukrainian revolution were a Belarusian and an Armenian. Um, over the course of the shootings, a Pole was killed, Russians were killed, not just Russian speakers, that's a different thing, Russians were killed, Poles were killed, um, five Jews were killed, victims of, of these repressions. Simultaneously, more or less, with the repressions and the, and the fall of the government was a Russian invasion. So 
In the second part of this talk, I want to try to discuss what I think are the most interesting underlying structural realities of this invasion. Um, I'm, I'm consciously separating it from the discussion of the Maidan because I think it is something rather different. There, I don't think there is a story in which the Maidan automatically leads into an invasion. Um, I, I think in retrospect we're supposed to think that it does, but there's no particular reason why the Maidan story couldn't have ended with the, dem with the democratic presidential and parliamentary elections that then followed, right? That would be a perfectly normal revolutionary trajectory. You overthrow some government, you have some elections, you know, and then, <laughs> then you make your own problems after that, right? That would be the Ukrainian, the natural Ukrainian ending. Um, but that's not how this ends. This ends instead in a completely different way, which is that Russia invades. So I want to now try to discuss the Russian invasion as a more or less distinct event, which I think it was a distinct but, but very interesting event. And I'm going to try to break it down, not so much in terms of its chronology, but in terms of, its, in terms of, of the way it's been prosecuted. So um, I don't think that this war is chiefly about um, Crimea or, or Donetsk or Luhansk oblasts. I think this war is chiefly about Europe. Um, this war is a continuation of the policy that was announced in 2013 of trying to supplant, get under, get into, dissolve, overwhelm, overmaster, be better than somehow the European Union. Um, the original version of that didn't work out so well. Okay, the Eurasian Union is now um, not only is Ukraine not a member and never will be, but Belarus and Kazakhstan are having their hesitations. And the, the, I don't know how many of you have been following Belarus, but it's really interesting the way that Belarusian policy has, has changed, with Lukashenko becoming, if not Putin's most uh, analytical critic, I think probably his funniest critic. And if you haven't been following this, it's definitely worth going. So, so I'm going to just, okay, pause. So when, when the Russians invaded Crimea, which is where I'm going to go next, um, and gave the ethnic argument that it's a Russian territory, Lukashenko said, well, if that's true, it would make just as much sense to give Moscow to the Tatars as it does to give Crimea to the Russians, because after all, all of Russian history came from Tatar history. So if we're going to follow this ethnic logic, why not give Russia to the Tatars rather than the other way around? Um, didn't get a lot of coverage in Russian press. <laughs> you have to look for Belarusian links to get the story, but yeah. Um, anyway. So the original version, this Eurasian version, doesn't, doesn't work so well. But other things do work, and I'm going to try to categorize them. The first is the level of tactics. So as I've said, I don't think the war is actually the main front. I think it's one front among many. Um, but it is a revealing front. And of course, it's a very significant front for Ukrainians who are, who are living and dying there, and for Russians who are dying there. OK. What are the tactics on these territories? I would characterize the way that this war has been prosecuted as reverse asymmetry. Okay, so I'm, not, I'm now going all military on you. An asymmetric war is usually a, a set of tactics prosecuted by a weaker force against a stronger force, or a non-state actor against a state actor. What's interesting about the war in Crimea and in southeastern Ukraine is that the Russian state, although it's clearly the stronger party in this war, it has one of the best armies in the world, um, is fighting as if it were the weaker side. That is, it's using techniques like um, not having insignia, mixing in with the civilian population, claiming it's not really there at all, human shields, drawing fire onto large population centers in order to hurt, alienate civilians, things like this, which are classic partisan tactics and which work, and which work. Um, <coughs> but you know, they don't work so well that the Russians don't have to invade with conventional troops. They do that in August. They do it in December. But um, they, they do work to a, to a fair degree. This is combined with a domestic politics of the big lie in which the war is characterized in Russia as a civil war where heroic anti-fascists inside Ukraine are fighting off a fascist junta, yada, yada. Um, and uh, meanwhile, you know, the, the Russian technology is what actually changes the war. The Russian presence is what changes the war. So it, it, it's, it's, it's Russian fighters, which it's Russian fighters and Russian anti-aircraft, which grounds the Ukrainian Air Force, which is hugely significant, right? hugely significant. I mean, admittedly, they shoot down a civilian airliner every now and again, but the, this, militarily, it's that they ground the Air Force. Um, sh Ru the Russians are shelling from Russian territory, Ukrainian troops. The Russian Air Force has engaged the Ukrainian Air Force. Things like this have really turned the tide. And of course, thousands of Russians have also died on Ukrainian territory. Um, uh, there's, there's, that, there's that little fact as well. But, but the interesting thing, though, is, is as far as the point I'm trying to make here, is that what Russia has done is fought a very unconventional war. And I think the best way to talk about it is by is, is to th that they're using the they're using the weapons of the weak even though they're the strong. 
which is kind of interesting in terms of Russian history because it's not, I mean, usually the Russians overdo it on the other side of like, we're the great power, and, but here they're not. I mean, here what they're doing is they're saying, we're the, we're the small guys, or maybe we're not even there, and the people who are fighting are the underdogs. You know, the, the, the extreme version is here you got a bunch of pitchforks and they're fighting like the nuclear armed Americans, right? Like that's kind of the story that's being told. And that really is the point because part of this story is that these, these partisans are fighting uh, an international fascist conspiracy backed by the United States of America. And that is, in a way, the logic of the whole thing. If you think about it that way, which I don't urge you to, but if you think about it that way, then Russia really is the underdog, right? Like, if this really were a conflict between, you know, Donetsk and the United States of America, okay, Donetsk is then the underdog, right? So there is a certain ideological consistency with this. Now, as this war has been prosecuted, there has been um, no lack of clarity about its goals, I think. I think that the, 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 the way that the Russian leadership, um, from President Putin to, um, to Rogozin, Glazyov, and then people who are outside of the regime, Dugin, the way they've talked about it has been in terms of ending the Ukrainian state. So all of these things, which we've heard so many times, they sound familiar, even reasonable, like the ethnic rights of Russians or Russian speakers in Ukraine, the historical rights of Russia, the idea that Ukraine and Russia are one people, the idea that Vladimir converted, et cetera, in 1988, uh, the idea, as President Putin puts it, that Ukraine is a composite state. All states are composite states. There were no states created by God. I went back and read Genesis and checked. Um, <laughs> that, that we're all composite states. Um, uh, anyway, all of these are, way, are ways of saying the Ukrainian state is illegitimate, that it's exceptional, that it need not exist, at least in its present form. Which brings us to the strategy. The strategy, I think the best way of talking about this strategy is a, is a kind of strategic relativism. Because as I said before, the original way of doing this didn't work. I mean, so one of the things we have to remember when we, when we think of Putin as a fantastic strategist, which he's not, um, is that this whole thing is a series of mistakes. And when tyrants make mistakes, they almost never say, oh yeah, made a mistake. That almost never happens, right? I mean, this is something that you know Socrates noticed a long time ago, or Plato, that that tyrants are that there's a, tyrants have an information problem, and they also have a deny they have a problem with denial, right? And they make mistakes. It tends to be somebody else's fault. Classic point of political thought. Everybody knows it. Anyway, a whole lot of predictions went wrong here. It, they didn't think that they thought they could pay. They thought they could pay, they could stop the Ukrainians from signing the agreement. They didn't. They thought that it would be good to pay to put down the protests. That didn't work so well. I think they thought in annexing Crimea they would make the Ukrainian state fall apart, but it didn't. I think they then thought in supporting separatism a lot of people would come over to their side, which also didn't happen. So you have a whole lot of mistakes, which mean the original vision don't work out. The the Eurasian Union doesn't work out. Right at this point, nobody likes it. So, so what do you then do? I think what you then do is something called strategic relativism. That is to say, you accept that you are weak, right? And here we have to you know, grant a certain maturity and realism. You accept that you're weak and you ask, how can you weaken the other side? Okay? So it's not about being strong. It's about making the other side weaker. So this is operating at several levels. One is the transatlantic level. Very obviously, um, Russian policy is to separate the Europeans from, from the Americans. You know, the nice, the nice telephone leaks that they issue every now and again are a good example of this. Most importantly, though, is the European Union itself. And this is, I'm going to stress this in front of this mostly American audience. We, we, this is my American we, would really like this for, for it to be about us. Because one of the ways we're decadent is that we really like for things to be about us all the time. It's got to be about us, 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 us. Um, but sometimes things aren't about us. Um, and this is one of those times. Uh, this is really about the European Union. The Russians are pursuing a very intelligent policy of weakening the European Union at four or five levels. One is cultivating client states who are member states, like Hungary. Um, one is supporting separatism of any guys, any political coloration, so UKIP in England, but also the Scottish referendum. When the Scottish referendum did not pass, there was one country which issued informal protest, which was Russia. Russia claimed that all the votes hadn't been counted and that Scotland actually had seceded. Um, yeah. And when, and when Sputnik, the new Russian propaganda carrier, was launched in the US, they announced, you, might, you may not all have been watching this with the same avidity as I was, but they launched their year's coverage by saying 2015 was going to be the year of separatism. Um, Texas, Florida, <laughs> Donetsk, it's all, this, it's all one big story, world separatism. The year's young. We're, sorry? The year's young. Yeah, right, right, right. It's a, yeah. We can always dream. Um, but 
So I'm making, I'm making fun, but you know, this, this is a serious policy. Like you, you legitimate what's happening in Donetsk and Luhansk by saying, well, separatism is just what happens around the world, and it would be a good thing if the European Union fell apart, right? That's the underlying message. So they also support populism, right? Marine Le Pen and Vladimir Putin, in case you haven't noticed, have become very, very close friends, and recent, recent reports are to the effect that uh, the Front National, the big, ever bigger, successful right-wing populist party in France, um, gets a lot of loans from a country to the east whose name you know. Um, and then you, they also support, uh, and it gets worse, right? They also support the fascists, they support the Nazis. There is no place where they will not stop. So the referenda, referenda in Crimea, and then the ones in Donetsk and Luhansk um, for, to separate from, from, from Ukraine, um, the, the, the Russians invited observers. And who are these observers? With the exception of people from the German party Die Lenka, which is a story, a beautiful story in and of itself, they were uh, the European right, the far right, but also the fascist right, and also just the flat out Nazi right. Um, these were the people who came in order to legitimate, as it were, uh, this, this event. Okay. So what is the underlying strategy here? Well, certainly the, regi the Russian regime has a basic uh, existential interest in the preservation of energy markets remaining the way they are. It's much easier to deal with individual European nation states than it is to deal with the whole European Union, which now that you've alienated it by invading Ukraine, has started to come up in the energy policy, which is very bad for you. Um, little asterisk around Crimea. Crimea is a great example of how we let um, the Russian story become our story. So, you know, we think Crimea, okay, it was always Russian. Like I was recently with a bunch of extremely rich and important Republicans, because uh, that's the kind of social life I have. And, um, <laughs> and, and they were saying, and they were saying, but Crimea was always Russian. I thought, okay, that's interesting. Like this, like if there's anybody in America who I thought might be resisting this, it would have been, you know, these people. But no, like they thought Crimea was always, and of course Crimea, not, I mean, nothing's always anything, but I mean, Crimea is many things, right? It's Greek, it's Turkish, it's been many different things. Um, that always Russian is something that it's not. Uh, but they were they they were buying into this. Um, you know, they were like they didn't actually say Kudim Nash, but I you know, was kind of expecting it. Um, but of course, the significant thing about Crimea are the are are the shell gas fields. The only place in the Black Sea where there's a lot of shell gas is what is within Ukrainian, not Russian, Ukrainian um, uh, maritime territory, right? Uh, but now if you take Crimea, that, that is now part of Russia, which doesn't mean the Russians are going to use it. They're not. They don't need it. But they're keeping, it, they're keeping the Ukrainians from using it, and they're keeping the Europeans from having it, right? That's the most important thing about Crimea and taking Crimea. So anyway, there's, th there's an attempt to make the European Union fall apart, and it corresponds, I think, with a really interesting uh, intellectual difference, let's, let's put it that way, because I think there is a sincere difference about the way the, pol the way the politics work or should work. In the thing that the Maidan ha does have in common with the European Union um, is a basic understanding about how politics works, which is uh, you have to have civil society to have a state, and you have to have a state to join Europe. Okay, that's sort of the, the bedrock of the way the European internet, the European system works. The European Union is a collection of states, but it's not a collection of any old states. It's a collection of functional states. Um, we cannot form a state and join the European Union. We have to first show that we are very functional. Um, Ukraine, to put it politely, has not you know, met that standard. Uh, but the way to make the state functional is to demonstrate or to take part until it is. So that is one model of the way politics works. You try to make your state functional, then your state can join the European Union. The European Union then reinforces ideas of rule of law. That's one idea of how politics works. There's another idea of how politics works, which is that that can be broken. <laughs> you can intervene from the outside at the, at the level of civil society, at the level of the state, at the level of the EU, and you can break it. And that's the Russian approach. It's perfectly intelligent. Um, it's to be respected, I think, for its intelligence, and it's working to, to, to a large extent. Um, now, this brings me to a little point about civil society, which is a crucial concept here. The Maidan is clearly a, an example of civil society, like in the East European sense of the word, of something between the state and the individual, something which is spontaneous, something which is political in the sense that it's about changing the state, although it doesn't come from the state. The legitimation of this kind of activity would be the Jeffersonian one from the Declaration of Independence. That is, if the state does not behave predictably, then society has the right to behave unpredictably as well. I'm paraphrasing Jefferson because I am not an American historian, um, but that's the basic idea, right? That if the state does not obey, the, if, if, if there's no rule of law in the state, then society has the right to insist upon it um, and to break certain rules itself. Now, 
from in, 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 in the mainline Russian interpretation of the Maidan, that's not what happened. There can't be that thing. It doesn't exist. The civil side doesn't exist. There's no such thing. And that, I think it's fair to say that's not true. Like, I think it's fair to say that civil society, under some definition, you might disagree with mine, but under some definition it exists, like that what we're doing now where nobody paid you to come, you know, with three exceptions that I know about, but, it, <laughs> but um, that nobody paid you to come and nobody paid me to be here and, you know, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. um, except Pat in affection, you know, that that, that, that is, that, that is a, like, that's an example of a, vol like, these voluntary things do happen. They actually exist, right? There's not, not everything is, is a result of conspiracy. But you can misunderstand civil society and destroy it by misunderstanding it. Like that's one of the, that's just a kind of East European historical lesson. You don't, if you don't believe in it, you can destroy it. By not believing in it, you can destroy it. If you treat it as a conspiracy, you can use that as a way to destroy it. That's how it's happened in the past. Okay. Which brings me to the, the, the last point I want to make about all this, which is um, the, what's happening at the level of philosophy. The philosophy of this conflict on the Russian side um, is a kind of applied, and now I'm at Brown, and I'm really good, well, I don't know what, I don't know what they teach at Brown. Maybe there's been like some kind of revival of 18th century studies, I'm gonna be surprised. But um, w w what, that didn't get very many laughs. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, it is a, it's a kind of applied postmodernism. Okay, it's, it, it, they've recycled a lot of things that I learned in the 1980s, and they've used them to great effect. Um, the propaganda, there, so, so I'm talking about the propaganda and the way the world is being presented. Now, some of the propaganda is just traditional techniques but applied very intensively. Like, for example, making things up that didn't happen, right? So you, you, can, you construct an alternative universe in which there were certain things that happened, like the story of the small Ukrainian, the, the, uh, the, the story of the Ukrainian army crucifying a small boy, okay? That simply did not happen, but it's a pretty big feature in the alternative universe. There, there's another traditional technique which they perfected, which is, I would call, um, I hope gracefully, liberation from context, okay? So anytime anybody says any sentence, there's the risk that that sentence will then be placed at some point in a half hour documentary, right? In which you have all kinds of beautiful visuals which lead up to how awful this sentence is. So if you're President Obama, for example, and you say anything about how you're supporting Ukraine, then there'll be a half hour documentary where like they make fun of you for saying Ukrainians are making their own choices and they talk about how awful like the ad Maidan, and then like your little sound bite comes in at the end, and by then you look like a complete idiot and a loser. They're extremely good at that. Um, it's called, they, they also, their, te I mean, their, their interview technique is something called tape to live, which is, which is really cool. So they do an interview with you and they tape it and then they like pick out the things they want to take out of context, and then they invite other people to come in live and make fun of you, right? So like, generally, so like, uh, uh, like my American colleagues are kind of going through this one after the other and saying, "Oh yeah, that didn't seem fair. Did they do that just to me?" No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is this is what they do. This is the anyway. That's more or less traditional. What I'm interested in explaining here, um, briefly, are the things which are which are a little bit more intense. Um, one of them is political marketing, which of course we also know, but they I think have perfected. So telling stories um, along the lines of what people want to hear. And the, the two main stories that have been told about the Maidan and the war are the fascist story and the geopolitics story. The fascist story is that, uh, however you like, all the Ukrainians are fascists or the Ukrainian revolutionaries are fascists or whatever. Um, that story uh, basically delayed the, anyone in the West from putting two synapses together for about six months, right? So it was pretty effective. And then the, the one which is dominating now is the geopolitics story. So there aren't really any Ukrainians, they didn't really make any choices, there's not really Ukraine, forget about Ukraine, doesn't exist. What really matters is America, you know, and America, America and Russia, the superpowers, it's all geopolitical. And a lot of us go for this because, as I mentioned, we like stuff for, to be about us, right? As, a lot of our international relations theorists really like our stuff to be about us because we're a power. And it's all about power. Um, so that's, but that's a story. The geopolitics thing is a shtick. It's a trope. It's a way of trapping you intellectually. And that's basically cost us another six to nine months. We're still in the middle of that one. We got over the fascism one more or less, but the geopolitics one we're in the middle of still. Okay, but then there, then there's the stuff which is a little bit, oh, okay, let me give you some more interesting examples of this. So the part about marketing is you hit p different people with different stories, right? So the fascism one is pretty good in Europe because uh, it, 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 it splits, um, it, it, it attracts a lot of attention from the European left, including a lot of well-meaning people who are, of course, against fascism, as you should be. Um, then, but, but, it, but it also, but the geopolitics one, works well in Europe too, because what it says is it's all the Americans, right? So it's all about these grand struggles, blah, blah. 
So if you say it's all about the Americans, then Europeans will say either, okay, well then let the, let the Americans deal with it, or they'll say it's the Americans' fault, right? Which prevents them from developing coherent policies, even though it's really all about them, okay? But the marketing can get more interesting than that. So, um, so Ukraine, right? There's one line which says the Ukrainians are all decadent and gay. And then there's another line which says the Ukrainians are all fascists, right? And you, those are targeted for different people. You tell, you tell the, the, the European Christian right that the Ukrainian revolution is all about decadence and Sodom and so on. And then and you, tell the, you tell the European left that it's all about fascism, right? And eventually, you know, sometimes you, you, you say it's about gay fascism, admittedly. Like you bring the two together. But <laughs> you're laughing like you're hearing this for the first time. But I don't, I don't think you are. <laughs> I think you've been living with it. Um, okay, so... I think this is a moment for you. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, but so 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 but you see the point that you can mark it. You can you can hit people with different messages, even though they're contradictory, right? So, the most intense one is is the Jewish one, where some people are told that Ukraine itself is an example of the international Jewish conspiracy. Uh, that is, anti-Semites are told that, right? Because there's a big anti-Semitic constituency out there, and then other people are told that Ukrainians are all anti-Semites. Now they can't. Those you know those probably are not both true. Right? Maybe neither one of them is true, right? But they're probably not both true. The point is that you, 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 this is marketed, it's targeted. But the really deep stuff and the really effective stuff, which is bringing me to, to where I want to end, um, has to do with what I would think of as, um, as a kind of calculated cacophony. So, and again, this is, this is a little bit familiar because we do this, Fox News definitely does this. All this, a lot, this is, I, I think of this as sort of one big problem that we're having with the Russians rather than something that the Russians are doing to us or that we've prepared ourselves for, prepared them for. I think it's one big conversation and we should see it that way. Anyway, calculated cacophony is when something happens that you can't control, you then, you hit it with as much, in many, as many weird interpretations as you can so that the event is overwhelmed by the interpretations. So, um, uh, so let's say, for example, that, um, that, that, that you accidentally shoot down a civilian airliner, right? Not a good thing. Um, the traditional, old-fashioned way to deal with this would be to deny it, but there is a better way to deal with that, and that is that you, you throw up truly weird interpretations of it. So you say, you know, Ukrainian fighter plane shot it down, even though that's technically impossible. Or you say it was a natural disaster, although that's really unlikely. Or my personal favorite, you say that the Malaysian airliner that went down over Ukraine was the same Malaysian airliner that disappeared <laughs> over the Pacific, which was meanwhile taken into possession by the CIA, filled up with corpses, launched from Amsterdam, and then blown up by remote control over Ukraine to make it look like the Russians did it, right? So now the point of these of throwing all this stuff into the air is not that you're supposed to believe any one version. The point is to sideline the event itself. Right? So you don't think about how horrible it is that 300 people just died, right? And so, the, and so that you don't think about the, most, the simplest explanation for what happened. The expl and what actually did happen is very simple, um, very simple, in fact. So simple it gets to the heart of why this is a problem for us and not just for the Ukrainians and for the Russians. What happened is very simple. Um, the Russians shot it down. Um, and, you know, and, and not only do we know this, but in some sense we knew it in advance. And this is, this is, this is the frightening part. What do I mean by that? How did MH17 go down? Well, uh, the, there, there were Russian tank units in Ukraine. Russia had invaded Ukraine. Uh, Russian tank units are always accompanied by certain kinds of anti-aircraft capability because the great enemy of concentrated tanks are fighter planes. You have to be able to get them in advance at high altitudes. Uh, we knew, we knew, although we wouldn't say, we knew that Russia had invaded Ukraine. We knew that there were Russian tank units in Ukraine, and we knew that they never go anywhere unaccompanied by books, unaccompanied by this anti-aircraft capability. We also knew that their sensors distinguish friend and foe according to Russian fighters and everyone else, right? So we had the knowledge last summer, when this all happened, uh, to reroute civilian airliners. But we didn't because it was too hard for us to say Russia had invaded Ukraine, right? If we say that simple thing, it follows logically that you have to get the civilian airliners out. So of course, I mean, the responsibility for shooting down that airliner is the responsibility of the people who invaded Ukraine. But there's a sense in which we were brought into it in our inability to speak or think straight about what was actually 
happening. And in that sense, you know, this is the great difficulty. This is the great philosophical difficulty. Um, and so what I'm calling the philosophy is also, you could also flip my whole argument around and say this is the tactics. This is the day-to-day -day meat of what's happening. Um, this is how we're being approached, how we're being, how we're being changed. Um, that the philosophy is part of the tactics and that people literally live and die because we're unable to think straight. Uh, okay, which is where I, where I wanna where I wanna end this. Um, I wanna end this on a note of, of, of thinking about, this is gonna sound really old fashioned and like when you have to, you have to wait 20 years after you graduate from Brown to use this word that I'm about to use and the word is truth. Um, the, the, there, there is, um, see you, you graduated 22 years ago. Um, so the, the, the thing that I just said about MH17 is about simple old fashioned Aristotelian truth, right, non-contradiction. Non if you know that there are Russian troops, if you know there are tanks, this all follows. It's just a logical chain, right? Um, and logical consistency has been a big problem for us. Um, I mean, we, admittedly, we've had help, but it's been a big problem, right? So, I mean, think about some lines of propaganda which you have all heard and ask yourselves whether you have actually thought about the contradictory character, right? So if I say that there is no Ukrainian state, but I also say the Ukrainian state's repressive. If I say there's no Ukrainian nation, but I also say all Ukrainians are nationalists. If I say there's no Ukrainian language, but I also say Russians are being forced to speak the Ukrainian language, I'm contradicting myself, right? But not a whole lot of our response has been along those lines, right? It's more, it's more been, hmm, that's confusing, or hmm, maybe that's right. And the problem with accepting things that are contradictory as possibly right is that you can't possibly be thinking yourself when you do it, right? And in a way, that's where this is all headed. It's not about you accepting this or that proposition. It's about getting inside your mind and preventing things from working. So that's the Aristotelian truth. Um, there's a legal kind of truth, which is at stake here as well, the connection between the individual and the state. Um, the convention across much of the world, or at least uh, much of the Western world, much of the world, is that we have a legal relationship to the state called citizenship. The moment that we admit categories like Ruskimir, um, civilization or ethnicity, we are uh, accepting that that truth has, at least is in competition with other kinds of truth. Um, that, that, uh, that that legal truth may be, may, be, uh, may be subject to challenge or even over. Another kind of truth which I think is at stake is what might be called existential truth. So people did or didn't choose to go on the Maidan, right? They did or they didn't. They did so for their own reasons. They took risks. Many of them paid quite dearly. They, took, they, they, they defined themselves by what they were doing. And there's a sense in which that truth is being taken away. So if the Maidan itself is forgotten or if Ukrainian choices, choices made by individual Ukrainians become part of some larger story about ethnicity or language or geopolitics or what have you, then that individual kind of truth, like you're making yourself by the choices that you make, the choices that you make, the, the truths that you decide to uphold, that, that goes away. And the most important kind though, and maybe the fundamental kind, um, and a kind that I hope you know, we're in some sense now taking part in, uh, is what you might call social truth, which depends upon trust. So it's very hard to be right all by yourself. Um, usually, you know, if we're right, it's because we're in some kind of conversation with other people, with other people who we trust, either personally or some kind of institutional reason. An in, a university is an example of this, right? That you're in an institution where uh, certain figures have some kind of authority, right? You, you, your peers are in a certain kind of relationship to you. It's very hard to get to truth all by yourself as an alienated individual, right? It's, it's actually very hard. Um, and that, so, and this ultimately depends upon trust. And I think civil society in this sense, as the basis for us believing in certain things, a plurality of things, not any one thing, but believing that some things are true, that, that may be the ultimate stake in, in all of this. Um, because if you, if, you, if you can be brought to believe that it's all a matter of conspiracies and who really knows and you can't trust anybody, then you're in a world where you're all by yourself. And if you're all by yourself, there's no truth. And if there's no truth, then you're all by yourself. And that, in the end, is the point and maybe the real, the real danger for all of this. So I'm, I'm gonna close there um, with renewed and repeated thanks for inviting me back into a place uh, where I once had um, all kinds of groups who helped me to learn how to think and how to trust in thinking. Thank you very much.
Thanks. So yeah, I'm happy to take questions. If you don't mind just saying saying who you are and um, and and then asking your question in the form of a question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the East Europeans laugh. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, but I'm not quite getting your NATO European Union divide because in passing you said this is not about NATO, but you made clear this is all about the European Union. Most European Union members are also NATO members, uh, and I had the and, and indeed in the, in the northwestern European press, it was a big deal made out of the uh, Russian uh, disagreement with NATO enlargement. So how does it come into this? Because it seems as there's a bit more to it than you suggested, uh, at least in your lecture. Yeah, I think there's I think there's uh, more and less. Okay, so um, thanks for that question because I think that, that this is this is uh, this is a place where um, very traditional sort of old-fashioned historical chronolo chronological arguments are really helpful. Um, and uh, this is one of the ways why places where I disagree with a lot of people because I was f I was following this day by day, and then the NATO enlargement issue I've been following for the you know for the past twenty five years. I don't think so, and here's why. Um, I wouldn't claim that the Russians are enchanted with NATO or with NATO enlargement, but if you look at the chronology of NATO enlargement, um, the decision to admit Poland which is the most significant country in this context to NATO was taken in 1994, right? So uh, 21, 21 years ago. Um, uh, the, the Ukraine was not about to be admitted to NATO. That's a complete red herring. Um, Ukrainian public opinion was solidly against NATO, and I think for good reasons. I think that was completely sensible. In the world before Russian invasion, I don't see why Ukrainians would want to be in NATO. It's, you know, but, and, and ironically, the only way you get a, a Ukrainian majority in favor of NATO is to be Russia and to invade. Now public opinion for the first time is in favor of joining NATO, which doesn't mean it's gonna happen, it's still not gonna happen. Um, but my point about this is that there is no, I don't see any chronological connection between anything NATO is doing and the Russian change in policy in 2013. It's true that NATO enlarged in 1999, and the decision was made in 1994, but I don't see how that's connected. The Russians are certainly talking about a lot of stuff that did or didn't happen. Like there's this big, there's this big, um, there's this big push which some of the Western media have also picked up on that supposedly in 1990 Bush promised Gorbachev that NATO would never enlarge, which that did not, that did not actually happen. That simply did not happen, nor could it have happened, because in 1990 the Soviet Union hadn't fallen apart yet, right? So you you can't. It's hard to imagine that. I mean, again, this is like being an old-fashioned, like dumb chronological historian, but you can't make promises about countries that don't yet exist and how you're, what your policy is going to be to them, right? So not only, did, not only is there no document in any archive, at least anyone has found, which suggested this is true, I don't think logically it could have been true. Now the other chronology is the chronology of 2013, where what happens, and I, I tr tried to stress this in the talk, is that the first Russia, the, the Russian reorientation in 2013 is not to say we don't like NATO. They don't like NATO, that's a constant. The reorientation is to say we don't like the European Union. That's what's new. And then when the Maidan comes, they don't hit it, they don't hit it with you guys are a bunch of NATO spies. They hit it with you guys are a bunch, you guys don't understand you're letting yourselves in for pedophilia and so on. They hit it, in other words, with the anti-EU propaganda, which has already been in, in the works. The NATO stuff, crucially, comes in in full force after Russia invades Ukraine. That's when the NATO stuff starts. Now in retrospect, it gets all blurry because they've been hitting this now with the NATO stuff for a year. And so we think, okay, maybe you know, it's been about NATO all along. But even following the chronology of their own propaganda, NATO only comes into it after they begin a war of aggression. So I'm not, I'm not really buying it. And, the, there, and there's a, the, and then, well, so why are they talking about NATO so much? Because, uh, because NATO works really well at, 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 uh, at two levels of propaganda. The first is, um, Russia, it's much easier to rally Russian public opinion around NATO and the Americans than it is around the European Union, okay? So it's true that Russians are less and less attracted to the European Union, just as Europe, Ukrainians are more and more, but it's much easier to design NATO uh, and, and the U.S. as enemies than the Netherlands and the EU. It just, it just, it works much better. And then in Europe, it's much more divisive, right? Because if Russia flat out said, hey, you know, we're for, we're against the European Union, um, you know, we don't like you having your 
your, your, your visa-free Portuguese vacations or whatever. We're against that. People, you know, we don't like your public health insurance. You know, we don't like the fact that you're rich. People might eventually get it that, like, Russia is against them. But if, if Russia says, oh, no, we're against, the, we're against Atlanticism, we're against America, we're against neoliberalism, yada, yada, we're against NATO, that has a lot more resonance in Europe. So I, I think, I, I realize I'm in the minority here, that, like, most people are going for this realist thing, but I, I don't think NATO has anything to do with this, actually. Um, so we just go around like this. Yes, please. Part of I read that Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons after the breakup of the Soviet Union to Russia in exchange for a pledge that Russia would not breach Ukraine's sovereignty. But subsequently, I read that those were actually Russian nukes, and Russia simply repossessed them, sort of like our having the Greeks in Turkey or Subic Bay, which is true, and do you have any more detail about that? Uh, uh, that, that that's, that's, a, that's a really nice game show question, because it's like, is it, is it A or is it B? It's A. <laughs> it's not B. They were not Russian. No, they were not Russian nuclear weapons based in Ukraine. What happened was that the Soviet Union fell apart, and what had been the Soviet nuclear arsenal was distributed among the Russian Federation, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And by the terms of the breakup of the Soviet Union, the, the states of the Soviet Union inherited uh, the military forces and capacities that were on their own sovereign territory. So those were Ukrainian nuclear weapons, just as they were Kazakh nuclear weapons. The Kazakhs did the same thing. And in 1994, I'm now just going to develop version A, which is the correct one. In 1994, um, Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons. It was at that time, numerically at least, I think the third nuclear power in the world. Um, they agreed to give up their nuclear weapons in exchange for some loans um, and in exchange for a promise from uh, the Russian Federation, the United States, and Great Britain not just that those countries wouldn't invade Ukraine. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it was that these three countries would undertake to protect Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. That's the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. So it's not just that Russia promised not to invade. It's that Russia actually promised to help Ukraine um, protect its own territory. So this was a pretty flagrant violation. And incidentally, President Putin's response when this was pointed out to him was to say, the Ukrainian state no longer exists. Therefore, our prior agreements with it no longer hold force, which is an extremely interesting doctrine, if you think about it. Now, what's really bad about all this doesn't have to do with Russia and Ukraine. It has to do with the rest of the world, right? Which is even bad from, I mean, there's a whole version of this talk, which is why, why, Russia, why Russian policy hurts Russia. And this is a good example. One of the things the Russians like to talk about is, not the Russians, but, um, you know, Kisilyov, Russian propaganda. Certain members of the Russian uh, leadership like to talk about is how they could turn us all to ash. Okay, they could turn us to ash. But the problem with breaking the, the, the Budapest me me memorandum is that you're telling the whole world that you should really keep your nuclear weapons, or if you don't have them, you should develop them, right? This was probably the worst setback for nuclear nonproliferation in the history of nuclear nonproliferation, because a big country with nuclear weapons undertook not to invade or to protect a small country that got rid of nuclear weapons and then invaded it. It's a nightmare scenario for nonproliferation. And everyone is taking notes, including a lot of countries around Russia, right? So Russia has now made more likely a scenario in which it's going to be surrounded by more countries with nuclear weapons. So yeah, anyway, that's the story. So I was just going to go this way. So let me, Professor Cook and then. Um, thank you. So that was a great talk. I, I have a question though. You, you set the whole context for Russia's reaction to to, um, to Ukraine in, in terms of the Russian domestic and foreign policies of 2012-13. But does the, the Russian behavior in Georgia in 2008, which also was in, in response to noises about Georgia moving westward, maybe joining the EU or NATO, so is is and I know that, well, actually Russia did invade Georgia, but only briefly, and then it kind of broke off those two pieces of Kazakhstan South Ossetia. So is the logic and the drivers of the policy in Georgia different from those in Ukraine, or, in, and if so, why? Yeah. Uh, I think some, some things are very similar, but there has been some change over time, and I, w I would more see it as... The, the factors that were relevant in Georgia are still present, but other factors are present too. So um, in Georgia, unlike in Ukraine, there was a very serious conversation about NATO. I agree with you that um, the Russian interest in Georgia has to do with that. And they've, they figured out then, if not earlier, that if you can you know, invade a country before it joins NATO, you can make it hard for it to join NATO. Um, I don't think the Russian leadership in 2008 would have invaded Ukraine. 
Um, I mean, it's the same people I, I know, but I don't think they would have done it. And I don't think in 2004 they would have done it. I think they've changed over time. And I think the, the, the difference that I tried to stress is that they've categorized European Union enlargement as a problem, which for me is extremely significant because NATO, I mean, NATO doesn't, for, for, I mean, now I'm going to go back into my, like, my, my, my Russophile mode. NATO doesn't really matter for Russia one way or the other. It can enlarge, it can enlarge. It's not going to invade Russia. It's really important in, like, all kinds of propaganda ways, but it doesn't really matter for Russia. Russia's relations with the European Union, however, matter hugely for Russia because that's their biggest market, right? That's where they like to travel. That is, that's what really matters to them. And also it matters to them just if you're going to be a realist, um, as people like to be, um, then what matters in Russia's, in Russia's power position in the world is the ability to balance between the European Union and China, its two great neighbors, both of which are economically much bigger than it, right? So if you, if you, if you throw the European Union away, you're basically throwing yourself at the knees of China, which is kind of what's happening. I mean, again, that's not, they're not stressing that. I mean, the, their line is we're going to China to show the Europeans we have an alternative. But I mean, what they're really showing is they don't have an alternative. Because <laughs> the moment they have any kind of problem with Europe, they have to immediately go to China and sign a gas deal, which is manifestly not in their own interests. Um, so, so I think that the real, the, the, the real, the, the significant thing here is the change in doctrine about Europe. Um, but significant for Ukraine for all the reasons we've talked about, but also significant for Russia. Because what Russia has done just putting Ukraine aside for a minute, is making it much harder for it to get back to the position that it was in in 2011 and 12 with respect to the EU, right? Because one, one way this could all end or could never have started is that the European Union and Russia do some kind of a deal <laughs> which respects the interests of both sides. I mean, if Putin had just said in 2000, if Putin had said in 2013, okay, fine, Ukraine has an association agreement. What I want is an association agreement on much better terms, he would have gotten it. And there would be no sanctions, and Russians would be traveling, and there were, you know, and, and Russia GDP wouldn't have collapsed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and now they're in a position where they have to really, really struggle to get back to where they were in 2013. Now, again, this is all analysis, which is not filling the Russian airwaves, but I think this is more or less what's going on. Susan. Um, thank you for that talk, which was which was wonderful. I have a question that's a little different from these others, which is about the ways in which talking about policy and politics today and talking about Ukraine have or have not affected your writing of history because you're still an archival historian and someone who spends a lot of time working in both primary documents and sort of secondary sources and writing about parts of the 20th century and not the 21st century. So I was wondering the ways that, that doing this mode of being a public intellectual have affected your scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say something really simple and say, say I hope not at all. That is, I hope it's the, I hope it's the other way around. So. There's certain things that I do as a historian which put me in a position to play defense. So for example, um, I, 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 historians have an, are natural defenders against, against myth um, because we're, like, first of all, we're, we're, we're aware of it as a kind of concept that we can put it away from history. But also we can say some of the things about it which make it seem less powerful or at least less true, right? So like, you know, if, if, if Vladimir, of course, that Russian pronunciation of his name didn't exist in 988, but, you know, if he indeed converted to 988, which is not at all certain, right, he did so for totally strategic reasons, weighing Western Christianity as well as East. He apparently converted at least twice to Eastern Christianity. According to the Arabic sources, he was a Muslim. You know, the state was a sort of Jewish Viking conglomerate, blah, blah, blah. Like, if you, could, if you say these things, sorry? The best kind, by the way. Yeah, 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 right, okay. Um, I'm not going to say anything about that um, because I'm being recorded. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing how much difference that makes. So uh, it, the the point is though that historians can kind of surround myths by these kinds of sort of tiresome facts, and then they can put the myths into context, which you know isn't just an, a scholarly exercise because if you actually do things like if Russian soldiers are dying because Vladimir supposedly converted to Christianity in 98, that there's a tragedy in that, and if we if we can put that into context, we might actually be helping in some sense. So, you know, it helps you play defense. Also, you notice if other people are reading history, right? Like I, Putin is reading history. That's actually a demonstrable fact. That, and he's not alone. I mean, in the Russian leadership, they're reading a lot of books now. They have reading circles up there. No, they do. They have reading circles. Um, unfortunately, they're not, there's not enough cross-pollination with like Californian suburban housewife reading circles. I think there should be some kind of exchange where like the Californian suburban housewives can choose a book one week and Putin gets to choose the next week, right? I think that would be good for everybody, honestly. Um, 
But they, they're, re they're reading, a, they're reading. you can almost tell what they're reading, actually. They're reading um, exile, interwar Russians. Um, and, and, they're, it, cause you, and you see it in Putin's speeches, like the way he's thinking about history and also the things he says about history. But I only know that because I have some sense of what, you know, Russian exile in the 20s and 30s, what that did, what the ideas were. But it's also demonstrable fact, like some of them talk about what they're reading. So I'm not just, you know, I'm not just speculating here. And then you can see where this takes them and how, in the, as a historian, you can then maybe react to that a little bit and say, okay, well, this is one way of seeing things, but it's not just true, right? So when, when Putin talks to teachers of Russian history and says, well, we all know this, that, the other thing. No, we don't all know it. That's just like, that's the one book that you just read, you know, three weeks ago, but it's not necessarily true. Um, and, and, and beyond that, you know, you then you have certain kinds of, you have certain kinds of intuition. So the relationship, so my, my, the book that I've, as you know, I mean, the book that I've just finished that I've been obsessing about for the last five years is about the Holocaust. What does that have to do with this? Well, I mean, for one thing, if you're trying to explain the Holocaust, you end up thinking about a whole lot of things which are not the same thing as the myths and the political exploitation of the Holocaust, right? So the Russians go into Ukraine and they say, we're doing, one of the things they say, I didn't talk about this, one thing they say is we're saving the world from another Holocaust. You know, okay, maybe that's just an abuse <laughs> of, of, a, of a history, right? Which is what it is. Maybe that trivializes the memory of the Holocaust. That's fine, it does. But there's something else going on, which is that in order to have, in order for the Holocaust to happen, um, the Germans first had to destroy the European system and, and get inside of and destroy individual European sovereign states, right? Like that's just, that's how it actually happened as a matter of historical fact. It's a long argument, but it's, that, let's just assume that's the case. Because I think that, I'm much more alert to Munich and Anschluss and the beginnings of the end of the European system. So I don't look at the tragedy of the European Jews or the, the, the horrors of the Second World War from the back if I look at them from the front, like what happened, what had to happen first. And so then when Russian doctrine is things like, um, we have their ethnic rights, not state rights, the, um, the conventional state no longer matters, then I think of Carl Schmitt, right? And I think of, I think of Munich, I think of Anschluss, I think of the beginning of the end of the European system. Um, and one of the reasons why I think it's justified to think about that is that I think they are thinking about that too. I think, I think I'm in this with them. I think they're thinking about it as well, just that they're thinking about it positively, like as a lesson. So I, I think it's the other way around, and I try very hard to make sure it's the other way around, that it's the stuff that I think I know that allows me to take other things apart and, and, to, play, and to play defense. I think, if it's the other, I think if it's the other way around, then you have real problems. Okay, so I was going like, yes, please. Thanks, uh, Tim, at your uh, visiting fellow here. Um, I really liked your uh, idea about um, uh, reverse asymmetry, and I guess my question is going to be a little bit about us, about the U.S., since you didn't talk about us. Um, and that is, you know, we have, in a sense, a political constraint of the aftermath of the Iraq War and the disaster that that was, and the context of any kind of very active and, you know, even sending weapons to another country as opposed to troops becomes kind of this aggressive foreign policy associated with John McCain and the political right. Uh, and, and then the Europeans have that same kind of, you know, the, the, they have that same frame where it's not about Ukraine, it's about Iraq, Libya, anything but Ukraine, or Russia. Um, and I guess my question is, um, how, does that, how does that political constraint um, inform what should be the appropriate policy response from the U.S. and Europe, knowing that, you know, this is a very real constraint. I mean, you know, th this isn't just about being confused by Russian propaganda. It's not that Obama and his team are watching too much Russian television. It's that they don't want to say these things and then take the consequences because they believe either they don't believe it's a good idea or they believe that the public won't support it because, uh, because this is what they were elected to do, was to end wars and not get involved in a new one. The Germans are afraid of a, a war with Russia. Um, you know. How do, you, how do you kind of address that? I mean, that it's sort of like you could agree with everything that you said, and you could still say, OK, that's really bad news for the Ukrainians. I'm, I'm really sorry that they're going to be you know, stuck in this conflict. Um, but the interests of uh, the United States and Europe and the constraints politically that they suffer, you know, th they may not want to, uh, to take those kinds of aggressive actions. OK, well, taking the point of your question, um, I, I think that the way you phrase it has a couple of gaps. Um, first, the alternatives are not take aggressive action 
and shrug your shoulders and say we can't do anything because there was an Iraq war or a Second World War. There's a whole, there's a whole big filing cabinet full of stuff that we can do short of military intervention, Iraq style, um, and, and, and nothing. Uh, and the second, the second little, little gap is I don't think it's right to, to, make, to, to create an alternative between we're watching too much Russian TV and we just think, what can we do because of our own constraints? That's a, it's a mutually reinforcing pattern. Because the, see, the, the Russians are aware of our soft spots because they, they understand us much better than we understand them. And everything they do is meant to get hold of our soft spots and just twist them a little bit so they feel a little bit softer than they actually are. That's what they're after. Um, that's what they're trying to do. So, you know, with the question of arms, of course they, they, they give us this, you know, they give us a lot of stuff which suggests that it's going to be a horrible escalation because they know that it's a close debate in the U.S. If it wasn't close debate, they wouldn't bother. So I don't actually think you can make, you can make this separation between Russian propaganda and our, as you sort of put it, objective historical constraints because they're playing with our constraints all the time. It, they're playing on them beautifully. That's what they do. That's what they're good at. And it's not, you know, Russian television. I mean, RT is the second largest English broadcaster in the world. Um, and there are all kinds of ways in which the American NGO sector and even American journalism are affected by, by Russian propaganda. And also, you know, our, not to mention our, our, legis our, our parliament <laughs> our, is also affected. I mean, th so it's not, it's not that Russia's over there and we're over here. It's one big discussion. Anyway, how to answer your question. I think if we drew the conclusion, I mean, the conclusion you draw, I know you're doing this for, for the purposes of, of illustration, but the conclusion that you draw, oh, this is too bad for the Ukrainians, but, you know, it's not, you know, that's what we're supposed to think. You know, that's what we're supposed to think. And, it's, and, and thinking that is supposed to be deadly for us. That's the whole, that's, that's the thought which will kill us, and it's meant to kill us, because this is not about Ukraine. Um, it's about us. Ukraine is a way of getting to us. And if we decide that it's just about Ukraine, then, what, then the conclusion is, oh, let's have another ceasefire at Minsk. And let's just keep having ceasefires at Minsk, like, okay, let's have one when the war, let's have one when the war is about Luhansk, and let's have one when the war is about Zivotsevo, then let's have one when the war is about Mariupol, let's have another one when it's about Odessa, let's have, you know, let's keep having ceasefires at Minsk. The ceasefires at Minsk are a consumer foreign policy. Like, they're, they're us telling ourselves that, oh yes, this is a local problem in Ukraine, and now we've solved it by flying to Minsk and spending 18 hours. But, I mean, if this analysis is right, and since in, for your, in your question you said, okay, let's assume it's all right, so let's assume it's all right. If this is all right, then if we do nothing, what happens is the prog progressive disintegration of the European Union and the transatlantic relationship. So well, the answer to your question then is in terms of our policy, I mean, in terms of arming, the whole question of arming Ukraine or not, and, and as I see it, is a kind of red herring, right? Like that's putting all the emphasis in the wrong place. W the, if, we, if, we, if this analysis is correct, that means that what we need to be thinking about is how you secure a Ukrainian state on the principle that our system is composed of Ukraine, of, of sovereign states. How do you, how do you, how does the European Union respond to this multidimensional challenge? How do you keep the EU-American relationship going over the very, very, very long run, right? Like the next, so no, you know, let's assume this is going to last for 10 years. Um, and not just think, okay, this is a little problem in Ukraine, we're going to solve it or not solve, you know, because the, the whole arms, I actually see the whole arms debate as the triumph of Russian propaganda, that we've been put into this corner where it's like, oh, arms might be good, they might be bad. Wouldn't matter one way or the other, I don't think that much. The, in the long run, um, the Ukrainians are going to lose unless we help their state, unless we, and that includes helping their armed forces, but it's not limited to that. And the, in the European Union, I think, is going to fall apart unless, it, it, unless positive food feedback loops get established to match the negative ones that have been established so effectively in the last two years. So I think it has to be a full, I think the response has to be a full on response. Um, if, if, you know, if, if, as we, you know, we're tentatively agreeing, if this is right, then the response has to be one which says, okay, there's this multidimensional problem. We're going to have a multidimensional response, which isn't just care, I and mean, this is the, kind of my whole point, which isn't just, which isn't framed by the rhetoric that it's being framed for us in. Like, then we've already lost. In fact, this is how we're losing. This is actually why we're losing. Because this is what the Russians have, right? They don't have, you know, it's the main thing they have. The main thing they have is they're outsmarting us. That's the main thing they have. And until we get that, then, you know, then uh, there's not, I mean, all of our huge, like, you know, the Russians export as much as the Netherlands. Their GDP is as big as France, you know, that um, uh, their, their, their economy is way over-focused on hydrocarbons. They've got a lot of problems. They can't take that many military casualties, I don't think. They've got a lot of weaknesses. But so long as they're outthinking us, you know, eight ways to Sunday, um, they're going to keep winning. So 
Okay, that was a long answer. I'm sorry. All right. Yes, please. I just want to ask a follow-up on this question. So um, how exactly do you counteract? So they are, they are sponsoring the far-right parties in Europe. Do we sponsor far-left parties? What, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, so I mean, as I, there's a certain place where I stop. Like, so I try to, I mean, as I, as I said in response to Susan Ferber's question, like, I try to use the things that I think I understand as a way to play defense and conceptualize what I think is going on. I try not to be, like, real specific about policy advocacy. However, I would like to say that I don't think financing the far left <laughs> is going to answer, partly because uh, th th they've, they're already there. Okay, so the Russians also finance the far left. It's less important, le that's less historically significant because the far left is less historically, right now is a moment of the rise of the far right in Europe. And so, yeah, I know, but no, but the Greek government, as you know, is a coalition of the far left and the far right, and the Russians have it covered on both sides. On both sides, they've got, they've got both sides on that one. Um, uh, so y y anyway, but no, I think, I think you know, very, very roughly, you have to decide who you are. I mean, I don't think, so, so like I, a lot of Ukrainians come to me, I'll rephrase your question, and they say, should we have propaganda the way the Russians have? Because the R Ukrainians have this sort of, they have an advantage over, well, okay, I'm talking to Ukrainian, but they have the advantage over us that they understand all this stuff. Like all the stuff that I take like an hour, to, like they more or less get it like that, right? Like none of this, like you can't, I couldn't give this talk in Kiev because they'd be like, come on, like every six year old understands this, right? <laughs> so you can't give this talk in Ukraine because the one, like the one people in the world who are not particularly moved by this stuff are, are the Ukrainians, right? So. Um, and, and, the, and they're familiar with these, all these gimmicks. And so a lot of the questions that I get from them are, are for like young Ukrainian journalists, right? Should we have a TV sender which is like RT, right? Should we have, should we counter their propaganda with our own? And I always say no, you know, and maybe I'm naive and stupid and wrong, but I always think that the whole point is that if that's what, if you do that, then they win. Be not only because, I don't, and I don't even mean that in just some dumb ethical way, that they're always gonna be better at it than you are. Um, and also, the whole point, if, if I'm right, you know, in my, like, in my, in my, in my deep normative, you know, Hannah Arendt moment at the end, if it's all about thinking and thought at the end of the day, if it really is a clash between two different styles of politics in which one is about making people fragmented and alienated so they can't think, and one is about creating the possibility for some kind of discussions, groups, and so on, so people can, if there really is that difference at the heart of this, and I think there is, then if you partake in it with your own Ukrainian or your own American propaganda, for that matter, th they're winning in some deep, objective way. So I, I, that, so I don't think you can fight fire with fire here. I think you have to recognize that you, you know, the way to respond is by trying to figure out who you are. And, you know, and this is when I, when I say that the Russians are right, they were decadent. I'm not sure I'm joking, right? Because I don't, like, I would have thought we would have responded better to this challenge than we have so far. And by we, I mean everyone from, like, you know, Kiev to San Francisco. I would have thought we would have done better with this. When they started all of this, I thought, okay, there's clearly, a, like, when I, and I saw some Americans popping up with the Russian message, I thought, okay, there's a problem here that has to be addressed. But I didn't realize that it, we were going to address it so badly. And so slowly, right? And so anyway. So going this way, Michael. So Michael Kennedy, sociology. Uh, I just taking the last thing that you said uh, to reframe the question I had intended previously, and that is, I can't decide now whether the debate about how far Russia will go is a Russian debate or a Western debate, because. According to some of the things that you said, I could imagine that this is not ending in Ukraine, and that, in fact, it would make sense, as Putin's lot gets worse and worse, that it would make sense to go into Estonia. Because if by going into Estonia, then you automatically trigger either the end to NATO or an American response because of NATO, and therefore confirm what Putin had originally said and that this is a fight with America. Mm -hmm. So that issue, although it was beginning to be raised you know, last spring by a variety of military strategists, is now almost a common sense anxiety among people in NATO that mm -hmm. Putin's ultimate aim is not the destruction of EU, although I think you're right, but that it is the destruction of NATO, which is a something that can be a victory for him. Mm -hmm. So is that a worthy or important debate for the West to be having now? Or is that a debate on Russian terms? The debate about what exactly? About whether 
we should be preparing. The debate is simply this, I think, which is what NATO people say. When are we going to stop him? Are we going to wait until he invades Estonia through this uh, reverse asymmetric warfare? Or are we going to try to stop him in Ukraine? Because we can't rely on his exhaustion, by virtue of your own analysis, because his exhaustion will just lead to more and more destructive behavior, which might, in the end, be self-destructive for Russia, but it's going to be destructive for a lot of others who are our allies now. Yeah. So I, I, I don't have a 100% kind of clear answer for that, I, because my, my gut conviction is that any calculation about the long term is not likely to be right, that some th other stuff is going to intervene along the way. So for example, what's the biggest problem that, that Putin is having now? The biggest problem Putin is having now is that oil prices are down because Saudi Arabia has decided to hinder American investment in, in shale oil and shale gas extraction by dropping the price. It has nothing to do with Russia. I mean, their propaganda is that like we and Saudis got together. and. It, but, like, but in fact, a Saudi policy directed against the United States, as it were, is the thing which is hurting Russia more than anything else. And, you know, like this is, Clausewitz said this a long time ago, but when you start wars, what happens is all kinds of things you didn't expect happen over the course of the war. And I think there will be more things like this. Um, if this goes on for long enough, I think the Chinese will stop, will, might be a little bit less discreet than they're being now. And because, you know, the Russian army is already stretched to the point where, like, y young men are coming from the Far East. It's not a big army. I mean, they're, they're only, fit, I mean, it's big compared to the European Union army, which is zero. But it's, <laughs> it's, it has a, you know, the, the number of men who can actually fight in the Russian army is like 50 to 70,000, right? So, which is big by European standards, but it's not huge, especially for some kind of long-term campaign. So, they, I don't think, I think it would be a mistake to follow either logic like that they're going to be exhausted, they're not going to be exhausted. I think what you have to do is secure, try to secure the things that you think really matter. Like think about it that way. So if you think Article 5 really matters, then you need to make it look like Article 5 really matters. If you want to try to win in Ukraine, you have to think about how you're going to win in Ukraine using some, some, using some kind of intelligent measure, which isn't just dictated by the Russian debate. And in the long run, Ukraine is completely winnable. I mean, it's completely, the Russians are not in such a great position there. But I, I think it's important not to follow the logic of, if we do this, will this make them overreact? Because we just do not know, right? Like, if you follow that logic, then you could say, what, so put it this way, what if we gave Ukraine to Russia? Like, what if we said right now, we have no, you know, like, like, um, like Eisenhower said about um, Korea. We have no interest, you know, this is, we have no interest in this at all. You know, take it, we just do not care. What would happen then, right? Would that then be, you know, would that be good? I tend to think it wouldn't be. I, I really, I do not believe that like, I don't believe that they're gonna stop because they've got Ukraine because I don't think it's about Ukraine. On the other hand, are they gonna stop because they get stopped in Ukraine? No, I don't think that either, right? I don't, I don't think there's any story which leads to this ending except when Putin leaves power, which of course will happen because, you know, it will eventually happen one way or the other, right? There are two ways it can happen basically, neither of which is pretty. Um, and it, it, so until that happens, nothing's gonna, I mean, I think, and so I think the real question is how do we secure what we think is important, knowing that we don't know which narrative is true, but yeah. I'm gonna take the privilege of asking the last question. Okay, well, yeah. uh, why don't you, two more? I'll, okay. I'll be brief. Um, yeah. I'm Gary, I'm a student. Um, I was wondering, you talked about the Budapest Memorandum not being honored by the Russians, like decreasing credibility of non-proliferation. Do you think that the West's part in that agreement is is worth saving to any degree? Um, yeah. And could you talk on that? Uh, I mean, I, I'll take even a step back from that. Um, this although the Russian interpretations of international law have been innovative and curious, um, they are a reminder of how important international law is. And if you do th draw that conclusion, as at least I do, it then reminds you how you should take your own commitment seriously, right? Um, that is sort of as a general. So with Budapest, I think it would be a very good idea for the Americans and the British to talk about Budapest, whatever they do to help Ukraine. Because they did oblige themselves in this very vulnerable moment, not only in Ukraine, but in world history. I mean, that those states gave up their nuclear weapons in 1994 was a very big deal for the world. 
I mean, it was part of the general pushback against the spread of nuclear weapons, and I think it was hugely important. So if, if the Americans and the British should, are, are in fact, I think, morally, if not technically, legally obliged to help Ukraine, and whatever they do, I think they should talk about Budapest when they do it. Um, if only, um, well, I mean, to lift some of the shame of their, <laughs> of what the, the, the absence of policy so far, but if only to try to slowly build up the credibility of agreements like this in the future. Because we have to remember that nonproliferation is, an, is a problem for the world which is going to go on and on, you know, regardless of what happens in Ukraine. And this has been a total disaster. And obviously the Russians aren't going to say, oh, yeah, we woke up today, we remembered Budapest, sorry. You know, that's not going to happen. So at least the Americans and the British could, could in, they could roll it into the preambles of whatever, you know, of their agreements to help Ukraine. I think, I think they should. And why do you think they're not? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think, I mean, part, they're worried about things which make it seem like, they're worried about everything which makes it seem like they're obliged to help. And I think that's been one of the problems. I think, I mean, I think rolling this back to a year ago, I mean, a year ago, um, I wrote all kinds of things which basically said the same things that I'm saying now. And one of them, one of them was about Budapest. I mean, there was a, and, and what I said was we should, you know, not only is this bad, but we, we need to immediately put this into our language about why we're going to help. Um, and the, the, the sad thing is that we are, I think they will now, but it's taken, it's taken a year to do so. I think there, there was this whole year where we were trying to avoid this confrontation with what actually happened. And, and I mean, going back to your question, it's partly, it's partly real hesitation, real worries about war, which are serious and should be taken seriously and matter in domestic constituencies in Germany and the US and other places. But it's also partly um, being spun <laughs> in a certain direction. I mean, Crimea itself, if you remember back to when it happened, I mean, it was presented as, you know, as a Maskarovka. It was presented as something that it wasn't. It was presented as, you know, some kind of mysterious local uprising. Who knows? Who are these people in green uniforms, you know? And then once it was all over, when it was all over and Putin gave his speech, he said, oh, yes, those people were Russian soldiers, yeah. right? But w it wasn't given to us straight, and we chose not to take it straight. And since we chose not to take it straight, then it was, we couldn't say, okay, Budapest memorandum was violated because our line was we're waiting to see what's happening, you know? And then after a while, that gets embarrassing, which is what, so, 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 so this is in a way why I concluded on this thought business, that if you can't, like if you're unable to define what's happening at the time, it's harder for you to keep your own obligations because you get into the psychological position where, okay, I'm not sure this has been triggered, and then you figure out six weeks or six months later that it has, and then it's kind of embarrassing in a way to do it. I don't have any better characterization for you than that. I, I, I wanted to ask, let's for a moment stipulate that we are in Kiev and we are the, 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 the Ukrainians who understand all of this pretty much by nature and that part of the propaganda is the Ukrainian state is a fiction. What is there, is your advice to them about creating a narrative of a Ukrainian state or a reality of a Ukrainian mm -hmm. state that's robust enough to withstand, withstand uh, that discourse? Yeah, so I think that the smaller problem is the narrative, I mean, the smaller problem is the narrative. I think by now, people have generally moved forward to the point where they know that there is something called Ukraine. Like if, if you if you think back, twelve months ago, fifteen months ago, all the news stories. I mean, almost all of them literally had like a map of Ukraine with a line drawn through the middle of it. Right? Do you remember this? Like we should be ashamed, basically. But we, um, but it's like having a map of America with like a line drawn through the middle of it. Like Mason the red Dixon. states are all here and the blue ones are all there. And don't you know that there's a line? You know, it's called the Mason-Dixon line, and everyone down there is white, and everyone up there is black, and they're also gay. And these, you know, like the idea of drawing a line through the middle of the country and saying like, oh, these people are like this. It's just totally absurd, and we wouldn't do it if we didn't regard the, you know, anyone you took seriously, you wouldn't do that to. But I think we have moved past that, at least. And you do, you do, do still hear people say, like, it's a divided country and so on. But even the war itself has disproven that because there's been so little support, so, so little support for actually moving away from Kiev. I mean, it's two, it's two oblasts, um, you know, and even there, the public opinion polls, interestingly, show the same thing that they show for the past 20 years, which is that very few people actually want to join Russia. I mean, they may not want to, you know, they, they want more local authority. So I don't think the, the narrative is less and less of a problem. I mean, they could definitely do a better job in telling their own history. Um, and here you have a kind of interesting difference in political, I, I think something like political style, where the Ukrainians are, they tend to communicate um, politically with pictures, 
Like if you look at the history of the Maidan, it's really a lot about images, which worked well at the time, but don't work well over time. Whereas the, the way the Russians handle politics is much less with pictures and much more with cliches. Like they hit you over and over again with cliches, like, you know, Crimea is ours, Ukraine's a divided country, over and over and over and over again, and eventually that sinks in. And there's, I think there's actually just a kind of irreducible difference in style there, which they, you, can't, you can't really ask the Ukrainians to fix. But with the state, here I think is the core of your question. Um, and I agree with you completely. It's not about, I mean, here it's not about a narrative. It's about, it's about a reality of a state, you know, because the, the Ukrainian state is weak, and that's, that's the problem. It's weak in the, in the basic sense that it can't provide um, day-to-day -day predictability for its citizens, and th which is what states are supposed to do. I mean, they're supposed to monopolize violence, which the state eh, kind of does, and, it's, and, they're, and they're supposed to provide the rule of law or predictability at a, a kind of baseline. And that is, that is absolutely what they need to do. And, I, you know, that's, I, you ask me, I mean, this is what I do tell them. And, and th this is, in, a, in an odd way, the key to the whole thing, and it trans, I'm glad this is the last question because it actually transcends almost everything that I've been talking about. The Maidan was about this. And ironically, the protests in Donetsk and Luhansk are also to, in large measure about this, <laughs> um, about like this lack of, un this, this feudal system, you know, which was slightly different there, but which is still a feudal system. Um, and the problems that Ukraine is having now in holding off the Russian military also largely about this. So, I mean, and, and the answers, ironically, I mean, it's hard to think about them outside the context of the war, but the answers have to do with, I mean, the kinds of things you've been working on, the answers have to do with relocating public funds, um, with, have, with, with decentralizing, with decentralizing, not because Ukraine is some kind of oppressive centralized state or like the people in Kiev oppressed Donetsk or Lviv for that matter, but because the Ukrainian state is so weak you have to build up capacity somewhere. You have to actually create capacity where none exists. You know, you have to create Ohio or Connecticut or Providence. You have to create municipalities, you know, Kodomadi, whatever. You have to create these units which don't exist and have them have some local control. Not because the Russians want federalization. Um, that's not relevant one way or the other, but because the Ukrainian state doesn't really exist at that level and has to be made to exist. So that's, you know, that, that is the, uh, that's the crucial thing. And the thing which worries me the most, one of the things which worries me about the war is the war becomes an argument against this, when in fact the war is an argument for this. Thank you. Thank you.